Good morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumke. Today we are joined by Neil Ware, the president and founder of Equally American. Welcome to the show, Neil. My pleasure to be here. Neil, tell us a little about e Equally American, a little about your own background. Sure. Uh, Equally American is a nonprofit organization that advocates for equality and civil rights for the 3.6 million U.S. citizens who live in U.S. territories. Um, I myself grew up in Guam, which is how I got interested in these issues. Um, when I was in high school, uh, reading my U.S. history textbooks, reading my American government textbooks uh, about the importance of voting, you know, voting for president, having participation in the laws you follow. And then when I turned 18, I had to register for the draft, um, but couldn't vote for the president of the United States. And that's something that really awakened in me this idea that there was something a matter with the United States relationship uh, with its territories, uh, or you could even call them colonies. Um, and uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working to address these issues through the courts, through Congress, uh, and through other advocacy. When we're talking about the territories, you, you're, you're talking, you're referring to Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands and American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Marianas, correct? Yeah, so, so there's five populated U.S. territories, as you said, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands here in the Caribbean, uh, close by. And then in the Pacific, you have Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, and in the Southern Hemisphere, American Samoa. Together, you're talking about 3.6 million U.S. citizens. Um, now, that's a population equal uh, to the five smallest states. Uh, but unlike those five states that have 10 U.S. senators, 15 electors in electoral college, and five voting members of Congress, if you move to a U.S. territory, you have zero representation in Congress and can't vote for president based simply on where your zip code is. So people living in Florida, if you move to, to Puerto Rico, you immediately become disenfranchised. And so those are some of the issues that uh, we try to address as an organization. And, and looking at how to talk about these areas, are they, are they territories? Is it appropriate to use the word colony? Um, it's just a factual description. This is a, a group of people who are required to follow uh, laws that they had no say in making. Uh, who are disenfranchised from a political process. If, if something goes wrong, as happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria with the recovery uh, and the FEMA funds there, there's no p mechanism for political accountability to hold elected officials accountable. That's the definition of a colony. Um, one way I like to think about this, too, in thinking about the relationship in each of these territories uh, and trying to connect that to people living in Florida or other states is what would be acceptable in your community? So if uh, you lived in a community in the United States that couldn't vote for president, that didn't have any voting representation in Congress, that was discriminated against in federal benefits programs like supplemental security income or Medicaid, would that be acceptable to your community here? And universally, the answer I get back is that no, that wouldn't be acceptable. Everyone should have a say in the decisions that impact their lives. But if it's not acceptable here in Florida, why should it be acceptable? And why should the United States view it as acceptable um, just because someone lives in Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands or Guam? When you talk about you know, US colonies, I think, first of all, the word itself is jarring to a lot of Americans who have the tradition of being an anti-colonial place by our very origin. Are people surprised when you're describing some of these discrepancies in the law about treatment of people under the American flag? Yeah, I think, I think most Americans um, aren't even necessarily aware that the United States has territories or colonies today, or that the people that live in these areas are disenfranchised or don't have the same political say. I think there's just a lot that uh, we as Americans take for granted, uh, you know, voting, uh, 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 equal treatment under the law. These are bedrock uh, American principles um, that when you go beyond the borders uh, to a place like Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands or Guam, um, the rules suddenly change. 
And the reason for that is a series of Supreme Court decisions known as the Insler cases, decided by the same court that decided Plessy versus Ferguson, that established this doctrine of separate and unequal status for the people who lived in these areas based on the color of their skin, the language they spoke, and their culture. So the same kind of discrimination that was the bedrock of the Jim Crow era and Plessy versus Ferguson that the United States has worked pretty intently to turn the page on continues to be the governing colonial framework and racist framework for the 3.6 million people who live in these areas who um, are 98% people of color. So there's, uh, there's a legal framework behind this. Uh, there's a racial element to this. Um, and in 2023, it's, as we're approaching 125 years under this relationship, since Puerto Rico, Guam, and other territories became part of the United States in 1898, it's really important for folks to start taking a fresh look at this and becoming more aware uh, that this situation even exists at all. Why has it taken so long through the court system to change this? You're talking about you know, cases that, that literally are over 100 years old. <clears throat> Why? Why are these still stand? Yeah, I, I wish I had uh, a better answer to that. Otherwise, we would have probably been more successful in trying to get them overruled. We've um, brought a number of cases uh, raising uh, issues about whether the Constitution follows the flag to US territories, whether principles like equal protection apply the same to residents of the territories, whether even, even something as basic as uh, citizenship by birth on US soil applies in US territories. And time and time again, the Supreme Court has avoided or dodged addressing these issues, even as they have taken up other issues, saying that, for example, this last year in a case, United States versus Valle Madero, the court eight to one said it's okay to discriminate against residents of Puerto Rico and deny them participation in the SSI program based simply upon where they happen to live. So if you live in New York or Florida, you get these benefits. You change your residence to Puerto Rico, you're the same person, you have the same disability, you have the same income, you don't get these benefits. So. This is all part of a highlighting a broader problem, both in the courts and in the political branches, of uh, a lack of recognition that a problem even exists that needs to be solved. And until the United States uh, officials and the United States general public recognize that there's a problem that needs to be solved, it's going to be very difficult to change uh, this racist colonial framework in ways that will benefit not just the residents of the territories who are most directly impacted by this, but the United States as a whole. Uh, we're, as you said, we're a country that prides itself as uh, the greatest democracy in the world, and yet we have 3.6 million citizens who are disenfranchised. Uh, democracy and colonialism are incompatible but until uh, there's a broader awareness um, that this situation exists and then a recognition that it needs to change, uh, we may well be stuck in this for more years to come. Each of these territories you're talking about has different histories to certain degrees and different mm -hmm. needs. And, and so what are some of the commonalities between them, number one? And then you have situations like in Puerto Rico where there's been a long-standing debate over a status issue. Mm -hmm. I imagine the status issue is different in different, different places, uh, different territories. So what, are the, what brings them together and what, what differentiates them? I think there's a number of, of things and, and really more things that unite um, people in the territories than um, maybe make them different uh, from each other, although they each have you know, different historical contexts, different cultures, and in some cases um, speak different languages. Um, you know, one of those most central things is just not having a say in the laws that they're required to follow, not having voting representation. When it comes to different federal benefits programs, it's actually interesting, certain programs like SSI apply in some territories, but then not others. Others, like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program food stamps, apply in other territories, but 
not not different ones. It's this arbitrary framework um, that you know almost requ requires a law degree just to understand what your rights are based on where you live, which is not the way it's supposed to work in a place uh, where on the Supreme Court it says equal justice under law. Um, and so that's that's one kind of challenge that uh, these areas have in kind of coming together. And then another piece is just as there's a lot of lack of awareness about the different territories in the United States writ large, um, the same is true in, in each of these areas. So if you ask people in Puerto Rico about Guam or American Samoa, uh, you're likely to get the same kind of blank stares as if you ask somebody in Florida that same question. So one of the things that we've been working on as an organization is trying to bring uh, these areas together to recognize that while important, significant differences exist, uh, at a fundamental level, there really is a lot more that draws us together. And then even more broadly than that, framing these issues in a way that um, the average American can relate to them, whether they live in Florida or Iowa or Georgia or, or Michigan, that the United States, simply put, there should, there should not be colonies in the United States. There should not be second-class citizens. These are things that we can all agree on, um, even as there may be differences of viewpoint in different territories about what the ultimate status goal should be. You know, should uh, a territory uh, become a state of the United States? Should a territory, the people of a territory, want to become independent or have some kind of treaty relationship with the United States? Those are all important conversations to think about and have, but until there's a fundamental understanding both in the territories and at a national level that there's a problem that needs to be solved, those questions on exactly what should happen in each jurisdiction or what the people of each jurisdiction might want um, are almost premature. Um, and, and we really are trying to focus a lot of our work and just getting that, uh, bringing people together around this idea that there is a problem that needs to be solved today. One of the course tenants from you know the founding fathers was representation. You know, no taxation without representation. You see a case right now that's working with the Cherokee Nation, fighting for a seat in Congress. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if they would win that case, what does that mean for other territories who are non-state actors? Or what could it mean? Yeah, I think it's a good example of you know where representation in Congress is not uh, inherently limited to states of the union. Um, you know, you have uh, even through constitutional amendment residents of the District of Columbia, not a state, um, able to vote for president because of the 23rd Amendment. Recognition that there are other groups of uh, folks in the United States, uh, like uh, Native peoples, who would benefit from having more specific representation uh, in the federal government. And, and, you know, again, this is... Uh, kind of going back to our history, you have uh, from very early on uh, the very beginnings of the United States and its constitution, a recognition that we the people um, was not just the states united, it was we the people of the United States, which Chief Justice John Marshall wrote in a prominent Supreme Court decision, included the states, the territories, and the District of Columbia. So while that understanding and kind of people's public understanding of what the United States means has shifted as territories have become more marginalized and more pushed to the periphery over time. The original understanding of the United States and the role of the territories within that was well understood that there was not any uh, inherent difference um, for the people who lived in these areas based on whether they lived in a territory or a state. And there always was the understanding that territorial status was meant to be very temporary until such time as that territory could either have full participation as a state or perhaps um, go separate and be independent. The problem now is that you have these territories which have transformed into colonies and has now lasted uh, almost 125 years. That's more than half the time that the United States has had a written constitution. Um, so, more, so for more than half of the United States constitutional history, there's been the existence of colonies that fly in the face of that very document. 
And so those are some of the things we're trying to work on changing and raising visibility um, at all levels of government and different communities across the United States. Is this, is this you yourself or a lawyer? You, you, you went to Yale. You're writing a case book on territorial law, as I understand it. Um, and you're, working, you're actively working on the legal angle of this. How much of this is a legal problem as opposed to a political one or an educational one, or is it a combination of all three? You know, I think it's all three. And one of the motivators for me to go to law school um, was really looking at other civil rights movements that um, other marginalized groups uh, who were politically disenfranchised, how have they um, worked to build power and agency within structures that were um, weighted against them? And so, you know, the one that is kind of most prominent is the African American civil rights movement. And you had, uh, as with the territories, you had Supreme Court precedent in Plessy versus Ferguson establish this doctrine uh, of separate uh, but equal that essentially justified the Jim Crow framework of that era. Um, and while Congress certainly could have acted, um, notwithstanding Plessy, to dismantle Jim Crow, um, the, both the political incentives and kind of the cultural understanding was that racial segregation in America and Jim Crow did not present a problem that needed to be solved. That started to change and change pretty quickly um, in the 1950s and 60s when you had the Supreme Court and Brown v. Board say separate but equal is inherently unequal. Uh, that racial segregation uh, and conflicts with America's foundational notions of equal justice under law. And having the court make those statements when combined um, with social mobilization through activist communities, both in the African American community and beyond, um, and with the education that that provided to the American population of just what Jim Crow meant and the harms it made not only on African American communities, but the country in a whole in terms of making the, the whole country weaker, um, then led to creating a political space where in the 1960s uh, you were uh, able to achieve results like the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s, 1965, or the Voting Rights Act. So similarly here, uh, the legal structure of the INSER cases serves as an obstacle to addressing uh, these underlying issues because so long as the Supreme Court says it's OK, it's much easier for the political branch to say, well, there's not a problem that needs to be solved here. So by challenging the insular cases, by working to dismantle that colonial framework, uh, combined with uh, organizing uh, in communities uh, and social movements and a broader education movement, it could be possible to recreate some of the benefits we saw uh, with this dismantling the Jim Crow framework to uh, the work that we're trying to do today to dismantle the colonial framework that continues to exist in 2023 in the United States. So you're talking about education and the politics being very important, you know, mobilization going on along <clears throat> in the time period of these, these monumental cases mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s. And, but <clears throat> you have a situation like in Puerto Rico, September 2017, where you have Hurricane Maria, you have over 3,000 people killed after the hurricane. You have yeah. examples that Congress has looked at of corruption, of contracts that shouldn't have been given, of mismanagement, not just from the Puerto Rican side, but also the federal agencies mm -hmm. serving the situation. You, you, and you had the American public paying attention because it's being covered by the media, yeah. and in many cases horrified because it's a shameful thing to see someone under the American flag people under American flag being treated that way. This is not to be a pessimistic question, but it's a challenge to you. If you have that situation, and it hasn't resulted in the change that you're talking about mm -hmm. and you're working towards, what gives you reason to believe that it's, it's going to happen? Yeah, I think one thing that I bring to this work uh, that folks sometimes joke with me about is that I'm, I'm always an optimist. So I, I, whenever uh, I have a setback, I'm always someone who's able to find silver linings. And we actually had a case uh, before the Supreme Court earlier this year um, that many uh, Supreme Court watchers thought the Supreme Court would take up to address and overrule the insular cases. 
um, they ended up not taking that case, much to people's surprise and chagrin. And you know, people afterwards asked me, you know, Neil, like, weren't you just devastated that this thing you've been working so hard on, this opportunity, uh, wasn't materialized? And my response to that, almost you know, half jokingly, was. Well, I'm, I'm very used to setbacks. Um, what I wouldn't have known what to do with is if we actually started having some real success in this area. But what Hurricane Maria and some of the tension that flowed from that has generated is an awareness in the United States that these areas even exist at all and that they face discrimination and disenfranchisement. Um, so that's an important piece of uh, the beginning of this work, just for people to recognize that Puerto Rico is part of the United States. The people who live there are U.S. citizens. They've been historically denied self-determination. Some of these basic facts that are becoming more common among the general population, but also among folks in media or folks in political decision-making positions. And so we can work with that. Um, these aren't the kind of issues, you know, just as racial segregation and trying to end Jim Crow. It's not going to turn on a dime and suddenly change. Um, the work we're doing with community partners, uh, with other organizations, with you know, different leaders, is really trying to change the culture around these issues to where uh, this kind of colonial framework is recognized as being unacceptable under the US flag, that democracy and colonialism are incompatible until we're able to create more of that kind of cultural shift, um, just as it was needed to create that cultural shift that uh, Jim Crow uh, and racial segregation uh, is incompatible with democracy, or analogized to another issue, marriage equality. You saw many years of advocacy in the courts, outside the courts, raising awareness about these issues. And then in a relatively short period of time, uh, there was a shift in the cultural understandings around these issues where there was broader support and recognition of something like marriage equality. So this is another situation where advocacy inside the courts, outside the courts, through social mobilization, community organizing, and through engaging with uh, folks in the media um, and, and political actors, over time you can start to shape that culture um, by continually pressing uh, the facts on the ground and the relationship the United States has with each of these areas against America's own principles and values. Um, and so when you see um, the President of the United States, President Biden, just this last week issued a very important executive order um, combating uh, racial discrimination and promoting racial equity, listed all kinds of different groups um, that would be focused on and that this would that this this organ this activity would benefit. One of the groups not listed was the 3.6 million people living in U.S. territories. So on the one hand, that's a setback. Um, on the other hand, it's an opportunity. Um, the president hasn't taken. Uh, While well, he's done a lot of things uh, that benefit the people of Puerto Rico in terms of some of the the challenges this framework has created, from uh, disaster recovery to uh, health care and uh, you know, climate issues facing the territories, uh, he has not yet focused on these issues by looking at the root of the problem, which are the insert cases and this colonial framework. In fact, the president has actually, through the Department of Justice, um, opposed calls uh, to the Supreme Court to overrule the insular cases. And so when I see uh, the president leaving out the territories and something as important as this executive order, on the one hand, I'm disappointed. On the other, I look at it as an opportunity for the president to take further action, particularly as we approach the 125th anniversary of uh, the United States having uh, these formal colonies that are in such conflict with who we are as a country. You're talking about solving the root problem, though, and you look at Puerto Rico, and of course there's a lot of an excuse given by Washington saying we would love to help Puerto Rico, but the Puerto Ricans can't tell us what they themselves want. Because you have mm -hmm. statehood, you have independence, you have commonwealth and variations thereof. So until they do that, you know, we'll just be sitting here helping you. You seem to only be treating symptoms but not root causes. Mm -hmm. Is that the case or what, what can be done? 
Yeah, I think people in Washington are always happy to look for an excuse not to do something for the territories. Uh, and that's one of the challenges is that kind of this, there's a lot of status quo is just really is the default. The default is towards inaction on these issues. People look to different debates or controversies, disagreements within the territories or among the territories as an excuse not to act. But ultimately, uh, this is a, a problem that the United States itself created. Um, Puerto Rico didn't ask to be a colony of the United States. The United States acquired Puerto Rico in 1898 as a spoil of war. The people of Puerto Rico have not been given a meaningful opportunity to exercise self-determination by, by being given a range of options to choose from. Um, there are some developments uh, in Washington where this last year um, different factions of the Puerto Rico status debate actually did come together to get legislation passed in the form of the Puerto Rico Status Act which there was still some controversy around, but it was exciting to see um, there start to be more of a consensus-driven process among both folks within Puerto Rico and in the broader Washington community. And then also having a process that was a binding plebiscite. So having, you know, asking someone what they want without assuring them that if they give an answer, they will get it. Um, that's not going to that's not meaningful self-determination. People need to know what their choices are and know that what they choose they will actually get in order to have a meaningful engagement on these issues. And so while we're still a long ways from kind of getting to that point, there have been some incremental steps in the right direction that with some leadership from folks like President Biden um, and folks in each of the territories, uh, I again forever the optimist, um, I think that there are some real opportunities, even just in this next year, as we have this 125th anniversary, to start fundamentally changing the conversation around uh, these areas into one that recognizes that there's a colonial framework that exists and that that needs to end for the United States to live up to its ideals as a country and also for the residents of each of these areas to be able to exercise meaningful self-determination and to live up to their own uh, best uh, interests and, and best future. Neil Ware, I, I admire your optimism and I, I wish you the best as you keep working on these very important issues. Thank you for joining us thank today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Global Perspectives.